My name is Beth Sharon, and I'm going to be doing my presentation on Oscar Wilde. A little background first, Oscar Wilde was born in Ireland in 1854 to Jane and William Wilde. He has two siblings, an older sister, no, an older brother, and a younger sister. His younger sister, Isola, actually died from meningitis when she was nine, which was something that he had written, wrote about later in his life. Um, Wilde was always excellent in school. He loved the classics, uh, Greek and Roman literature, which he definitely inherited from his mother, who loved them as well and read them to the children as often as she could. Um, he won a half scholarship to Magdalen College in 1874. And this is where he really studied the classics deeply and discovered aestheticism, which is the value of aesthetic of arts and music over socio-political functions. This is kind of where he coined the phrase, life imitates art, which speaks highly of his philosophy. Kind of like um, the beauty of life, you know, it can be found in art and should be inspired from art and, and instead of like art imitates life, which was the, the narrative beforehand, you know. Um, he, after college, he traveled and lectured for a few years. He came to the United States um, to try to spread you know, aestheticism and, you know, that love for beauty. Um, and he gained, you know, popularity through that and was writing a lot of poetry through that, through this time and um, short stories. He eventually um, wrote uh, in a lot of journals and newspapers um, his, you know, philosophies and, you know, encouraged other people to think of the aesthetic lifestyle. Um, he married Constance Lloyd in 1840, 1884. She gave birth to their two children by 1886, but in 1886, he was introduced to Robert Ross, who was a young scholar dedicated, as biographer Richard, El Richard Elman explains, to seducing Wilde. So he, you know, was always interested in Wilde and wanted to seduce him, and um, it was not long after this that his marriage began to fall apart. In 1891, he meets Lord Alfred Douglas. And by 1893, they're in love. Um, they immediately hit it off. They um, started writing letters to each other and seeing each other as often as possible. And he, uh, it was really hard for them to hide their affection for one another. And they were both already kind of viewed as flamboyant and, you know, gay in, 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 the, in the way we would coin it now. Um, and this gained the attention of Douglas's father. And he's, his name is the Marquis of Queensbury. After um, one night, he, the Douglas of Queensbury, I mean, the Marquis of Queensbury, um, leaves a note for Oscar Wilde. And it says something along the lines of like, Oscar Wilde, you know, sodomite, somebody, you know, who sodomizes people. And um, this prompts Wilde to start a case for libel against the Marquis. And then this case really becomes a celebrity case because Wilde is, you know, already at this point really famous for his plays. Um, and throughout the case, mountains of evidence is brought against Wilde that's proving that he's engaging in gay sex, which means the trial ends in a not guilty verdict for the Marquis. You know, he didn't um, libel uh, Wilde because the, the things that he was saying, the ac accusations were true. Immediately after the trial, Wilde is arrested for sodomy. He is quickly found guilty and sentenced to two years of hard labor, which was the maximum sentence at the time. And I'm pretty sure the judge in the case was even like, this was the most disgusting case, you know, I've ever presided over. He was absolutely appalled at the nature of the, the sodomy. Um, in some ways, this, you know, sentence to two years of hard labor is what led to his demise. The stress and the labor took a toll on his health and at one point in his incarceration, he fell and ruptured an eardrum, uh, which left him in the infirmary for months. After his sentence ended, he fled to France, where he lived for three more years, impoverished and exiled. Pretty sure his wife had ceased contact with him, but was sending him like three pounds a week for, you know, expenses and things like that, which was not much. He ended up dying of syphilis in 1900. Um, some people attribute it to the ruptured eardrum that he had had while he was imprisoned. Some of his famous works include The Picture of Dorian Gray, published in 1890, and The Importance of Being Earnest, a play first performed in 1895. 
The picture of Dorian Gray is the piece I wanted to talk about more. Um, it's his first novel, and it's an interesting piece because it was published twice, one short form and one long novel. The first time it was published, it was published in short form, and it was pretty universally blasphemous. Everybody hated it. The homoerotic subtext was so clear that, you know, for republication, Wilde had to edit and add sections to try to disguise the desire. The uh, novel follows Dorian Gray, a vain, narcissistic man that is adored by his best friend Basil and his new friend Lord Henry. Basil paints a portrait of Dorian, and it is so beautiful that Dorian wishes he could stay like the picture forever, and the picture would age instead. This actually comes true, and it spirals Dorian into a world of filth and crime. The play ends with Dorian attempting to destroy the painting after he's murdered Basil. Now, um, the painting is now old and gray because it is aged while Dorian is still as young as the day the picture was painted. This instead turns Dorian into an old man and renders the painting perfect. So Dorian dies at the end. Sorry for spoilers. A lot of the text deals with desire and Wilde uses words like pleasure and charming to describe men in this piece, words that have clear sexual or romantic meaning. This foray into aestheticism by Wilde has reverberations that can be seen today in gay culture. In some ways, aestheticism is camp. It is the love and desire for elegance and beauty above all else. Some critics try to argue that Wilde wasn't gay, but was just incredibly aesthetic. But personally, I think that narrative is counterproductive to understanding the expression of homosexuality through history. And by that, I just mean that um, by making these claims after you know his life and his clear homosexual relationship with Douglas and those kinds of things, it's only pushing that erasure of like, oh, but he couldn't have been gay. He was a good writer. Oh, he couldn't have been gay. You know, he was just aesthetic. You know, that would like as if it would taint the meaning of aestheticism because he was gay. And I think 